So thanks for coming out. Uh, first thing I'd like to do is thank the Ocean Board. As I said, I'm the president. But if you're a board member, if you could just stand up and kind of wave a little bit. So Lynn is the vice president. We've got a number of trustees, Michael, Charles in the corner, Alyssa. I think Jeffrey is in the back. He's our treasurer. Mo is our membership chair. And we have a new, uh, and Shirley, who just stood up and in the uh, kind of the mustard colored shirt there. She's a brand new, she's an interim trustee for the board. So we are now back up to nine members as your board as we go forward into the fall. Elections are in October, just like always. We've got, it's a I year, so that means we have four trustee positions and named officer positions that'll be up for election. You'll hear about that uh, in the newsletter. Everybody got a newsletter, hopefully. The next edition should be coming out real soon. If you uh, don't get these electronic, you can get them through a bungalow alert. So see Lynn, get to put your hand up. Lynn is the vice chair. She also um, does our communications. So we have something called a bungalow alert. Something hot is happening in the, new, in the neighborhood like stormwater or pure or some other issue. We usually send out a bungalow alert about once a month. Quarterly, we put the newsletter attached to it. You can read it electronic. If you're old school like me and you really want it paper, again, it's out there at some of the uh, neighborhood businesses. If you're a proprietor like Brian Maine, who does wood repair, Brian's in the room somewhere. Um, he can. He's got an ad in the newsletter as an example of how to support us. So why don't we just go ahead and jump right in? I'm going to have the folks who are here representing the stormwater. These slides uh, on the easel here, they're going to talk to those. So if I could have Tom, and actually, are you giving the main presentation? So I'll uh, have Tom come to the podium. Thank you, Jim. Um, I believe you ready to um, advance that if you would, in the slide. My name is Tom Wilson. I'm with Wade Trim. Next tonight is Michelle Robinson. She's with Dialogue. She comes with our public Can you get closer to the microphone? <laughs> that a little better. Okay, Michelle Robinson over here is with Dialogue. She's with our public outreach program. And Will Stock will be here in just a minute. He's running a little bit late. He's uh, with the contractor that will build these improvements. So let me describe a little bit of the uh, Seminole Heights Stormwater Relief Program. Um, you can advance that, please. We're going to be upgrading infrastructure. Um, we'll show you some routes where this is going to occur, but we're going to be putting in some pretty heavy-duty conveyance for stormwater. Um, Crest Avenue, Florida Avenue, I'll show you some more of that. That's the box culvert on the left over there. That one's a little taller than the one we'll be using. We'll also be putting in some round culverts. And we'll be doing a whole lot of uh, stormwater inlets. And all the streets that we go down will get brand new curbs, and gutters, and pavement, and et cetera. Next slide. Wow, it's really hard for me to see that. Okay, there's a, there's our map, and we have an out a new outfall to the Hillsborough River that is at the end of Crest Avenue, and we'll have a box culvert that proceeds to the east from the river to Florida Avenue, and it kind of zigzags a little bit across Florida Avenue to Central. Um, in Florida Avenue, the box changes to a round culvert, and then as you can see on this. The green lines are where our stormwater conveyance is. The city decided since we're doing so much work in here, they added some more elements, and that includes a bunch of water main upgrades. We'll be upsizing some of the water mains and adding fire hydrants, and mostly replacing aged lines, uh, lines to make them more reliable. And we also are going to be upgrading some transportation or mobility improvements in Central Avenue between Osborne and Hillsboro. We'll be adding bike lanes in there. And I think there may be some questions about that. I've got a board over here that shows that and you can look at also. And we'll hope to get started here in fall of 2021. Earlier today, the Water Management District approved the co-funding for the project. 
So the city will be um, taking care of the other half of the funding. Next slide, please. These are some of the um, improvements on Central Avenue. There will be uh, bike lanes in both directions. We'll have a rapid reflecting beacon crosswalk at Wilder and Central for the a lot for the high school students. And we will be reducing the speed limit. We're gonna be narrowing up the corridor a little bit. We've got um, what they call bulb outs where the curb comes out, makes it a little closer for these crosswalks and it calms the traffic a little bit. Next slide, please. We do expect this project to take approximately two and one half years to build. Um, once we once we get out on uh, from the river up to central, um, we're going to spread out a little bit more. There's some of the work goes all the way up to Hannah Avenue and across Hannah to Nebraska. Uh, we're going to be crossing I-275 at uh, Caracas Street. That's going to be in a micro tunnel, so you may not see that if you're just on the interstate. Okay, next slide, please. Some of what to expect during construction. You can see the uh, pipes and culverts here. We're going to have some large trenches. We do have an arborist on board, and we're going to be doing some tree trimming. Um, very few um, trees that we take out, but there are a few on the project. They're not so much in the right of way. Um, a couple by the river where the outfall is, and we adjust it so those are not as desirable of trees. But uh, we will be doing a lot of trimming, and uh, particularly in Crest Avenue, we're going to have a pretty wide footprint. We're replacing a water main couple of sanitary sewers and this warm water box culvert there. It's going to be pretty snug for a while. Next slide, please. We do want to make sure that everybody stays informed. We do have a website here. It's nice and simple, easy to remember, SeminoleHeightStormWater.com. You can see all of these maps and more, and you can also see some details on the mobility improvements in Central Avenue there. That's, we'll stay in touch also using um, other means, and eventually when we get to construction, we'll even be door hangers and the like shortly before we arrive. That's really all I had um, today. I tried to keep it brief. If you've got any questions, we can certainly uh, like to answer those. Tim, do you want to? Tim. Is there any consideration for stopping no. trash from going through the stormwater system or I guess into the Illinois River? Very good question. Um, yes, we have incorporated the uh, outfall structure at the river. It's going to be mostly underground, but it will include two very large trash racks that will keep anything the size, you know, plastic bottles, uh, those things up will all get intercepted there and will be periodically visited and emptied by the city. That is our, our last catch, if you will. We also have a couple of treatment boxes further upstream in the system that remove nutrients and they also have some filters in them to get out some even finer trash. Uh, that's good for this time I'm out in the future. I don't want to hear too far off the subject, but for that, keeping the trash out of the river, it'd be a simple way to put filters, just a, a simple, just a simple screen or something on so many storm drains to stop all the trash before it gets to the river. Because so many people spend hours and hours trying to clean this stuff, but we can stop it before it gets there would be the solution. That, that was pretty much our intent on the new outfall. It's, it's a little bit tricky because you don't want this trash to block the flow. And then, you know, next thing you know, now you get flooded. But they've got a, a concept where the, the water actually spills onto a, a basket. We call them basket screens. And if the basket fills up with trash, then the water can still get around it. But the city is going to visit them 
periodically and hopefully prevent them from becoming the Thank you. Any, any other questions? I'll bring my phone on. So I don't have a well. Many of my neighbors do. My question is, you drop this into the aquifer. How long is it before it's coming out my tap? Is everybody else's tap? Oh, that's a new topic. That's the next, next topic. That's all right. It's a good question. Oh, you jumped ahead. You jumped ahead. That's all right, Susan. Um, I, um, I'm sorry. I'm trying to get out of this. Uh, I have some questions from the chat from Zoom. Uh, what is the plan to mitigate additional trash being dumped into the river? I hope we just I hope we just answered that one. We'll get a hundred percent of it at the end point, and and some other collection points in the system also. Okay. Um, how will the bike lane connect with the proposed F dot bike boulevard? On this project, we'll have those bike lanes from Osborne to Hillsboro. I understand DOT has future plans for it to go north um, of Hillsborough Avenue on Central Avenue, but that is not part of this project. So this will link up with that future work there. Oh, I'll just talk loud. So for those that don't know, right now between you, need, you need they can't hear it if you don't speak through their uh, on. So for those that don't know or don't choose to drive 30 miles an hour on Central between Hillsborough and Osborne and further south, the fact that you're reducing it down to 25 is terrific. And the people in this room, through your feedback, through the online surveys, the fact that Tom and his team have been here, this is either the third or fourth time they've come and talked to us. Please keep filling out the surveys. Uh, these groups do listen, whether it's the water department, stormwater, parks and rec, they put out those surveys to gather your input. So the flashing beacon to allow those kids to get across the street. I go up and down that road at least two times every single day. And during the school season, it is really scary watching those kids jumping out of their cars. You remember when you were in high school or if you go to Memorial, junior high, you're not thinking about a car coming by at 40 or 50 miles an hour, taking your door off, let alone your leg. So thanks for uh, all of you coming out and listening to Tom. Any last questions before we get on to the main subject? Do you have any reference? In reference to the changes, uh, do you work with TPD in reference to this? Because you can change the rules, but it doesn't mean people are going to pay attention. So how do you work with TPD in reference to this quarter right now in, in reference to the police being out there too, to supervise, maybe warrant first, and then ticket? We do work some with the police department and we will have full signage out there showing the reduction in speed limit, but we're also employing some other tactics like these curb outs. We're also going to have um, a delineated <laughs> drop off zone for the students to pull over right now. That's just part of the street where they pull over on the side. That'll be quarantined off a little bit and that helps calm the traffic. So. Hopefully, they'll be able to enforce the reduction in the speed limit, but we're doing some other things to slow people down, too. Are you going to be able to leave the easels so folks can uh, take a look after the meeting so we can put that be all right? Sure. Okay, so for those that have uh, great interest in this, uh, and I think there's actually another chart behind the one that's on display, which... It just shows the routes. Okay. And I think the, the routes on the website are probably a little friendlier and they're also a little bit more up to date. Okay. Yeah, this is not 100% accurate. Um, like okay. What's on the website and what was handed out is everyone did not get a handout that same handout is on the website. All right. Thanks very much for coming out. I uh, appreciate it. We're going to go ahead and move on. I know. Thank you. Uh, So I'm going to introduce the uh, the water department uh, director. Um, if you if you want to bring your team up, uh, I know that's the main reason folks are out tonight. Um, so there is a project called Pure, and I'm not going to get into the details. Uh, there is a a flyer that has been handed out to everyone. It's two pages. Um, that was not intended to uh, undercut what the director is going to talk to, but really just to add 
to the conversation. And I want to thank the uh, Friends of the Hillsborough River, the Sierra Club, and the League of Women Voters who spent multiple hours and have spent years literally working alongside the Water Department to try to figure out the best solution for the city and the residents. So, sir, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, Chuck Weber, Water Department Director, and I appreciate the, the opportunity to speak here tonight. Um, yeah, I'm not sure where this general overview came from. It's got some good facts in it, but I can I can tell I've got my work cut out for me because uh, there are, it's got a lot of feedback if I get too close. Is this good? All right. So um, th th there are a lot of things and a lot of concerns that are, that, are, that I, I, I saw this over you for the first time tonight that are here, but we share all these same concerns. And we've got our work cut out for us to go ahead and address every one of them. That's our goal. So I'm going to leave that overview behind and kind of focus on, on our presentation, if we could pull it up. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, please. We have three challenges that we're trying to address with the PURE project. The first challenge is maintaining minimum flows on the Lower Hillsborough River. And for those of you who don't know, maintaining minimum flows is about keeping a fresh water zone in the upper river just below the dam. And it's important for wildlife and the health of the city, really. So um, the city, as part of our water use permit, is required to maintain minimum flows, uh, fresh water minimum flows at the base of the dam. Our primary source for doing that is sulfur springs. But there's a problem with sulfur springs. It's getting saltier and saltier. And pretty soon, it's not going to be able to support freshwater flows. Now, sulfur springs was getting saltier before we started pumping uh, for minimum flows. But it's clear that after we started pumping for minimum flows, that the rate at which it's getting saltier is getting faster. So we're convinced that, you know, sulfur springs is not a long-term solution for providing minimum flows. We got to find another way to provide minimum flows. That's our first challenge. Our second challenge, you switch the slide, please, is increase, increasing the reliability of the Hillsborough Reservoir as our drinking water supply. Another important part of the reservoir is supplying 82 million gallons a day for the drinking water supply for the city of Tampa. And that's part of the regional supply plan. So it's, it's important for the city to be able to support itself with that 82 MGD because that affects our region as well. Next slide, please. And the third challenge we're facing is new legislation that's gonna require the elimination of discharge of our treated uh, reclaimed water into the Hillsborough Bay. That's a new law that was just passed this year. We have to figure out how we're going to do that and submit a report by November. Fortunately, we'll be able to change that, uh, our plans a little bit, but we got to be able to come up with a, um, a solution to where we're, we eliminate our discharges by uh, 2032, January of 2032. So that seems like a long way off, but it takes time to build things. So if we have to build something to uh, eliminate this discharge, we don't have a lot of time to build something. So those are our three challenges. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. So um, this is a, a project overview that just kind of talks about where we've been this year, where we're going for the rest of the year and kind of takes us out into the future. Earlier this year, we worked with the National Water Research Institute to do a technical review of uh, a lot of technical documents about the aquifer, um, contaminants that you find in nature, contaminants you find in wastewater, source control, all different types of um, aspects of a project that we could implement. Um, so we have a lot of technical information from previous projects that we could incorporate. And so what we did was we worked with the National um, Water Research Institute to look at those documents and to, to um, tell us what they thought we could do to improve other things we might have missed or things we can do to improve on, those on, the, on the technical uh, aspects of our project. The other thing we did was we engaged a consultant to do an independent review of all the different ways we could meet those three challenges. 
and they did an alternatives analysis. They uh, looked at 20 different alternatives, 20, around 20, and uh, in their recommendations, they came up with some combinations of those alternatives and it really came down to two different combinations that they're recommending we pursue. So the other thing that we've started to do is public engagement. Uh, we did a survey, a targeted survey, and some limited uh, focus groups to find out people are very interested in this topic. And here tonight, I can see people are very interested in this topic. So um, moving forward, we are going to ramp up our public engagement. I wanna come back here when we have more information, we wanna keep the public involved. Um, so after, you know, as we start the public engagement, we still have design and permitting to go through. This project, um, we haven't even picked exactly what it's gonna look like yet. We've got some ideas with combinations two and combination one um, from that alternatives analysis, but we don't even really know what it's gonna look like. As we move forward with the design and permitting process, we're gonna figure out what that looks like. And then after that, we have construction and then eventually operation. Next slide, please. So this kind of gives a timeline. And uh, you can see in the spring of 2021, that's when we did the independent anal alternatives analysis and we worked with NWRI to do the technical review. We're uh, right in that next step uh, between 2021 and 2024, we're gonna be working on public engagement and design and permitting. And that's gonna be an iterative process. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. And then public engagement is something we're, we will continue to do throughout this project. No matter what we construct or what we operate, we are gonna to continue to engage the public in this project. Next slide, please. So our next steps really are to implement the um, recommendations from NWRI and from the alternatives analysis to continue to do public engagement. And we need to hire some consultants to start on the design work, to start on the, the public engagement. So the, um, this kind of circle on the right here was just really meant to show it's an iterative process. We're going to meet with the community, hear what you have to say, try to incorporate all those stuff to come up with what's best for the city and incorporate those things into our design and in the direction we're heading. Um, permitting is going to play an important role in how our project looks like uh, when we're done because it has to be something we can actually get permitted in construction um, before Sulphur Springs gets too salty to use and before 2032. So um, I think with that, uh, I think if you get the next slide, I, I think it's I think we're at the end here. I knew questions would probably be what people are most interested in. So here we are, fire away. Okay, so um, let's start with change is always hard. And uh, there's a lot of people in the room that want to throw darts. I mean, that's very obvious. Um, that was not the intent of this flyer. Uh, the intent was really for education. So please take the time to really read it. Um, if it's not accurate, the group that put it together uh, is going to continue to meet with the city and continue to improve it. Hopefully it'll be something that the rest of the city can use. Uh, I know there's a lot of people in the room that have wells on their personal property. Some people use it to drink. Some people use it for irrigation of their crops or just irrigation of their grass. Um, so those are all valid questions. I am going to walk around and Lynn's got her hand up. So I know there's some questions that are going to be coming in through Zoom. Is that correct? So let's do a few of the questions. So we'll come. And the reason we got to use the microphone is for the Zoom. So that's why I need to walk around with it. Uh, we got a question almost immediately that, that wants to know why is the water getting saltier? <laughs> well, uh, that's uh, probably a three hour meeting to begin with. But there, there was a study done by a, a doctor student. I think he actually has his doctorate now at uh, USF. And they looked at uh, how the aquifer works underneath Sulphur Springs. And uh, just to kind of summarize it in a nutshell, as we pump Sulphur Springs, we pump more fresh water out of the ground and it gets displaced by the salt water coming in from the bay. In a nutshell, that's it. I have a question that I tried to ask earlier. I just want to know, I don't have a well, 
I wish I did, but I don't. Uh, I want to know how long it's going to take from this recycled material go in the aquifer and end up coming out my faucet, and how safe is it going to be? First question is, that depends. <laughs> it really depends on what option we end up going with. If we go with a recharge and recovery option, um, you know, it's, it's really same part of the same way the water cycle works right now. All right. Um, you, you have water. Um, let's start with water falls from the sky. It gets into the, it gets into the um, river. We pull it in through our intake. We treat it. It gets into the wastewater system. It gets um, treated again and it gets discharged as reclaimed water right now. And it gets evaporated, goes into the sky, falls into the uh, river, repeats the cycle over and over. Same thing happens with groundwater systems over and over. So it really depends uh, on how well, how far down you put the water into the ground, uh, how fast it can transmit through the soil, um, and uh, how, uh, how many treatment processes you have in between. Uh, just to kind of give you an example, to, for the water to make it through the drinking water plant, that takes about a day. Um, and for the water to make it through the wastewater plant takes it about a day. Um, it can take two to three days to travel through the distribution system and probably just as long through the wastewater collection system. Um, in some of the test wells that we've done with aquifer storage and recovery that we're doing right now with uh, potable water, um, basically drinking water, um, the detention time in the aquifer can be anywhere from uh, 31 days to half a year just to kind of give you a flavor. Okay, I have a well and that's my only source of water is my well. And so I am concerned about this water that's being injected into the aquifer. And I'm concerned about the chemicals and the hormones that you're not getting out of the water right now. Is that gonna be injected into it? And it says on here that you're drawing water back out at 300 feet. So is that going to affect the water that I'm getting right now? I guess that's my question. Those are all good questions. Um, let's start with the chemicals. That, that's a big concern. Um, they're there already. Uh, we can measure them in the groundwater. And they're, they can be, depending on the location, they can be higher than what's in the surface water. So um, our goal is going to be to put safe water in the ground, put safe water uh, in our drinking water system. Uh, will it be 100% H's and O's? No, and you wouldn't want that anyways because the H's and O's would leach everything bad out of the ground. So, um, you know, the, 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 the chemicals, the pharmaceuticals, they're there. We can treat for them. We can treat them to safe levels, just like we do for things like sulfur, sodium, um, you know, and, uh, you know, bacteria and viruses. We've been treating for these things for many, many years, and we've got many systems in place to remove them to safe levels. Well, what I'm saying is getting water. Right. So is it going to affect my water? Okay. What I'm saying is I'm not getting your water. I'm not getting the city water. I'm getting my water out of the ground. Is it going to affect my water? Okay. Um, is it going to affect your water as far as mix with the water that's in your, uh, that's the, I'd have to know how well, how deep your well is. And we don't even know exactly where we're putting the location of the wells. So I guess to answer your question directly, I don't know off the top of my head, we'd have to do a lot of um, research to figure out uh, all those details. So is the city going to do anything to, um, to make sure that my water stays safe? Yes, yes. I mean, to my individual well or, I mean. Yeah, we will not put in a system that affects existing wells negatively. It just won't be done. First of all, we wouldn't want to do it. Wow. And secondly, we wouldn't be able to do it because we're, we're required not to do it by, by the law. I mean, we couldn't be permitted to do it. Okay. Okay, I have a, I have a question. Thank you for being here and answering our questions. Uh, 
Um, you're doing a great job. I, it seems like there was a, an assumption made up front by the city that all three of these need to be tackled at the same time because uh, your alternative analysis is to solve all three, right? Were they looked at independently as well? Some of these issues existed before others. Obviously, the, the um, reliability of the Hillsborough River has been there for really decades. Uh, so that's been an ongoing issue. Um, the um, salinity issue with Sulphur Springs just came to light really in the last two years. And then uh, this last issue uh, has come to light, you know, really just in the last year. So, so no, they, they didn't all come to light at the same time, but as they come together, uh, we do need to address them. Um, whenever we have heavy rains or storms, there's always or often a lot of discharge into Tampa Bay of like untreated wastewater. Does this change that? Um, well, it, it depends. <laughs> uh, with City of Tampa, uh, we are blessed with a, an advanced wastewater treatment plant that has a lot of capacity. So we don't see the overflows nearly as often as a lot of other places do. It does happen occasionally and it's very rare. Um, but with this system in place, it would provide an even larger buffer of us to be able to move water to, um, to a different location after treating it so that it doesn't overwhelm the plant. I've got a, a question and I'm gonna hand, hand it off to somebody else. And then we've got a few Zoom questions. One of the things that I learned, which I did not know prior is wastewater has compounds, hormones, and other chemicals in it that's just part of normal human waste. And the plan, as I understand it, is to use UV light to clean up some of that, but that other water departments around the country that are facing a similar challenge, although not exact, are using reverse osmosis. So for example, uh, San Diego is um, using a reverse osmosis system, which I understand significantly more expensive. Can you speak to that? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because that is one of the really misleading things that's on here. Um, that UV treatment process was from a previous project, and it's something that was evaluated when we did the technical to see well, what can we get out of the UV process. We're, we're certain we're going to need to do something more than UV. It might be UV and something else. Uh, for example, that San Diego project uses UV, but it uses it in combination with peroxide for advanced oxidation procedures. And if that's required, that's what we're going to do. But there are plenty of other really good treatments out there. Uh, there's treatment processes that have been tested here in the state of Florida. The city of Altamont Springs, for example, uses um, uh, biologically activated filtration in ozone. And they have had a demonstration project going for years where they have successfully removed all kinds of harm pharmaceuticals and chemicals of concern, and they produce perfectly safe drinking water. So that there's a really good example, and there are others like it, where uh, membranes aren't the solution to everything. Even uh, in our drinking water process right now, we are uh, testing a process called suspended ion exchange. And uh, it's a technology uh, that we uh, borrowed from the Netherlands. And uh, it's been very successful in removing total organic carbon and uh, other contaminants. And it might actually be based on the testing that we did on our reclaim water, a very useful treatment technology to bring that to drinking water standards. So uh, we're not taking anything off the table at this point. We're hiring those consultants next, and we're gonna be we'll continue to work with stakeholders and NWRI to determine what are the right treatment processes. So UV is on the table, but it is not the only thing we're looking at. Um, okay, I have a, a few Zoom questions. One is, what is the plan to increase water supply to support growth? That is a super good question. 
this is not that plan. <laughs> uh, right now, uh, you know, the city of Tampa, um, St. Pete, and Newport Ritchie, and Pasco, Hillsborough, and Pinellas County are part of Tampa Bay Water. We make up Tampa Bay Water. Part of that 82 MGD is part of Tampa Bay Water. But if we need more than that, we're going to have to rely on Tampa Bay Water to provide us additional water. So right now, our demands um, really average around uh, the mid-70s. So if we get a lot of growth, uh, and Tampa's pretty built out, but we could still see you know, a, a significant demand in about 10 more years. Um, you know, we may have to purchase some water from Tampa Bay Water. That's, you know, and, and in the past, when we've had issues with the reliability of the reservoir and we couldn't get 82 because the reservoir couldn't supply 82, during those rare times, we do have to buy water from Tampa Bay Water. So right now, that's our plan if we need more water, but there's other parts to that plan. Uh, conservation has been a big part of our water supply plan for the last 20 some years. We've reduced our per capita demand, how much water each person uses per day by half in that amount of time. Now, there isn't a much, a lot of more blood to get out of that stone uh, because we do have some pretty strong conservation measures in place, but we're starting another program called Advanced Metering Infrastructure that will enable us to find leaks in our system, leaks on, the, on our customer's uh, side of the meter a lot quicker. Uh, it will also help us um, to get more information in the hands of our customers to see how much uh, water they're using and what their opportunities are for conservation. I mean, you can even look at how much water you're using compared to somebody who has the same size lawn, same number of kids, and you can try to figure out there are the ways we can save. We have a very active conservation group. Some of them are here tonight, and uh, they do a phenomenal job of finding ways to save water. So we will continue with that process. That is definitely part of our water supply plan moving forward. Okay. Um, I have another question here about uh, the places that the wells are going to be uh, located. Um, I, so... We've seen a map and it's not up here tonight that shows about half of them being located within the boundaries of Old Seminole Heights. What do those wells mean? What, what, what would those wells actually be doing? Would sure, I, I, I think I can answer your question. So first off, the location of those wells were from a previous project. So they're not set in stone just yet. Um, with a recharge and recovery option, which is one of the ones we're looking at, those wells would be somewhere in that vicinity. Um, but we haven't nailed down uh, the exact location. And each, um, I'm not sure what map you looked at, so I'm going to guess, but I'm thinking that each, each dot represents a cluster of wells on a very small site. There's a large well to do the recharge down to 800 feet and there'd be about three other wells surrounding it within 50 feet of that recharge well, and they would be the recovery wells. And so water would flow down to 800 feet and it would actually flow upward through the aquifer in that little cone to those wells right next to it. And um, under, that, you know, under that plan, it would be withdrawn at about 300 feet. So um, right now, uh, we have aquifer storage and recovery wells. Some of those dots represent existing aquifer storage and recovery wells. And we are taking water from our drinking water plant and sending that water down into the aquifer and recovering it in that manner at a couple of sites already. Uh, so uh, it, it's not a new configuration uh, for us. It, it's not a new situation for us. What's the to follow up on that one, actually, I, I mean, the flyer actually says 47 wells are projected to be added in the Seminole Heights area. And when Pure first came out, they said they would need to be close to the Hillsborough River, which sort of narrows that down. But what, what will those wells actually consist of? I mean, are there going to be pipes running across people's property? Are they, are they going to be loud? No, that, I mean, that, that's a very good question. Um, at the... Um, uh, at the Rome Park, um, 
the Police Athletic League. We actually have uh, the, uh, the existing ASR wells are there. They're located there. If you drive by there, you'll be able to see them. They're small. Um, they'll fit in a, in a corner of a park. Um, the, uh, they're, not, uh, they're not noisy. They're not loud. And they're not all injection wells. They're recharge and recovery wells. And I don't know if 47 is the right number. I, I wouldn't hang my hat on that number just yet because we haven't finished uh, figuring out exactly what we're doing yet. Will, they be on private property? Will, will the wells be on private property? That's a good question. We're not planning on that at all. Uh, those sites, I think, that were on that map were all public property, like fire stations, parks, um, things of that nature. Okay, and then just as a reminder, um, we are trying to put stuff out on our Facebook page. So the map that we're referring to, we received from the Sierra Club. And again, trying to be very open with the water department, we sent it to Sonia and she spent a lot of time researching where it came from. And it actually was contained in a couple of reports that one of your consultants put together. And if anybody's worked on a big project like this, you're talking about binders and binders and binders, hundreds of pages. So when Tim Keyport sends one page into the water department, I honestly didn't think I was going to get a response and certainly not as quick as I did. So Sonia, thank you very much for doing the research or whoever in your department did. Uh, we'll be happy to put that online. Sounds like there's a lot of still work ahead of us. I've got a quick question and then I'm going to hand the mic off. I just had my water meter replaced. And so I went out to the front yard and I asked the guy, what are you doing? And he said, I'm replacing your meter. I said, well, there's nothing wrong with my meter. Why are you replacing it? Well, it's been 10 years. So every 10 years, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, the meters get changed out. And I was like, oh, this is great. Now I'll know that I've got a smart meter that talks back to the city and lets me know when there's a leak in the house, et cetera. And he said, oh, no, you're getting the exact same meter that I just took out. So my question is, for water conservation, I don't know if a Wi-Fi enabled meter or something that talks back to the grid is a, you know, 10 times as expensive. Maybe you could speak to that because certainly for conservation, if I've got a leak in my house and I don't know it, you know, we're losing a lot of water. Sure. No, uh, actually, <laughs> uh, that is the advanced metering infrastructure program that I just talked about. And we are just starting that program. So, um, Bad news, I think you might have been one of the last people to get their meters in place. <laughs> Good news is in five years, you'll have another new meter. Okay. Um, so there's a request for proposals out on the street to hire consultants to help us do that whole program. It's a very large program. Obviously, it's not going to all happen in one year. It's going to take about five years to replace somewhere around 160,000 meters in our system. And we've got to get all the networking in place to make sure all those meters are read and write. And we're not billing people the wrong amount. That would be really bad. So uh, we're going to make sure we get it right. Uh, and we're going to do a little testing up front, install a few, make sure everything works before we start ramping it up. So it'll probably take about five years to complete. Is it working? Okay. Uh, well, I have a well and I use it. It's my, it's my water. And I had a question, and maybe it's because I really didn't really understand the aquifer. How does it work? I heard you say something about depending on the depth of the well. well so would it affect some people? The deeper you go, would you less likely get the water? Or I don't understand how that works. And secondly, second question is, um, is there a list with the city of Tampa that lists all the people that do still have active wells and I say that because I did call utilities and they said, no, no such thing existed. However, about 12 years ago, I had someone come out from Pinellas County, but hired by Hillsborough to come and check my well. So there has to be a listing somewhere of the people that do have active wells. Sure. I, I think there are some permit records you can go back and look at uh, with uh, the Southwest Florida Water Management District. But we have other tools that we can use like uh, GIS, Geographical Information Systems. We know there's parcels out there that don't have a meter. And if there's someone living there, they got to be getting their water somewhere, right? So those would be places where we would suspect there might be a well, and we would definitely go check before we did anything that would impact a well on that site. Um, I, one more um, Zoom question. 
what what is your description of safe for safe water? <laughs> All right. Uh, safe is safe. Uh, so the water we drink today meets all the safe drinking water standards. That's a minimum. Safe to the city of Tampa drinking water system means participating in the Safe Drinking Water Partnership. It's a program that was designed by the American Water Works Association. And the whole premise of this program is you go beyond just meeting the regulations. It's about continuous improvement, doing the very best you can for water quality. Uh, we've been a member of that partnership since it was formed, I think that's uh, 23 years ago. So we're coming up on the 25th anniversary, which would be pretty nice. Um, but that's what SAFE means to us. It means going beyond the regulations and providing the best water quality possible with what you have to work with. Um, so meeting, the, reg meeting the, the regulations has always been a minimum. That's been a philosophy at the water department for 20 some years. Okay, um, and I'm sure you don't know the answer to this yet, but will we be kept abreast of the, these maps as you develop them and where you think you're going to put these wells and where you know what the private wells are? Sure, yes. Short answer is yes. I want to come back here when I have more information because you have way more questions than I have information to give you. And I want to keep you involved and I want to help you influence what we do. So um, short answer is yes, uh, probably in about three months would be a good time to check because we'll be um, uh, getting our public outreach program rolling really good. And then uh, towards the end of the year, we should be getting uh, the design consultants on board and starting to figure out, okay, of these combinations that we're pursuing, what's the next steps? What are we? How do we make this decision? What do we decide? And so we'd certainly like to come back and hear what you have to say about that. I'd like to uh, point out, OSHNA is the biggest neighborhood association in the city. 8,500 houses. We don't have 8,500 people here, obviously. But there are roughly 87 neighborhoods in the city. So I did try to invite... Uh, the neighbors to the north in Sulphur Springs, and I don't know if uh, that gentleman's here tonight. He may be on Zoom. When saying he is, maybe okay. Uh, Kathy Hare is in the room, and uh, I know she's quite an activist in her area. Uh, I invited the folks to the east of Seminole Heights, which is 30th Street and beyond, uh, against the river, and I believe he's also online. They have a new uh, president, so the intent is to spread the word. You guys have got a lot. If every association has you come and talk at night, it's it's a lot of work. So uh, I'd like to recognize the fact that Mo and Elizabeth have been attending what's called fan meetings, which is a group that sits sort of up above all the neighborhoods, and they're trying to help bring information like pure stormwater, et cetera, to that group so that those folks can then bring it back to their neighborhoods. So I have a quick question, and then we're going to take another Zoom question, and I think we're going to wrap it up. Uh, one of the folks I spoke to said, why is the state sending an unfunded mandate down to the city of Tampa, and in fact, to every city in the state, as well as every water department, um, demanding that wastewater be considered a resource or a commodity that we can no longer discharge into the bay? So uh, we haven't talked about costs Maybe you could speak to that. I'm hearing somewhere around the price of about $6 billion, um, which is going to more or less double your water bill. So that's sort of a question. I don't know if you have an answer to that, but number two. Six billion? Six with a B. <laughs> no way. No way. Okay. No. no, no. Do we have enough? <laughs> It'll be in the hundreds of millions. Okay. Okay. And then the other question is, are the water departments, I know you have your attorney here tonight, Maybe she can speak to this. Are the water departments and entities like Swift Mud working together to push back at the state level to ask for more time to develop the best solution as opposed to rushing to the 1 November 2021 deadline? Uh, I don't know what every organization is doing out there. Uh, the ones that I have spoken with and work with, with the Florida uh, Water Environment Association and the Florida American Water Works Association. 
Uh, of course, on the drinking water side, uh, you, you don't really have a concern about this because you're not discharging reclaimed water, right? Uh, but on the wastewater side of things, I think, um, you know, there are going to be some utilities that have a real challenge with that and others that just don't. Um, you know, some of them are all, uh, there are some utilities that are reusing almost all of their reclaimed water at this point. Um, so I, I have not personally heard a lot of cry uh, from the wastewater utilities to push back. Um, so uh, I guess that's about the best answer that I can offer you. Okay, uh, and then I have one final question. How much of this project is dependent on the whim of the elected officials at the time? Uh, I'm going to go with very little. <laughs> uh, you know, a, a project like this is not something that, you, that you're going to take lightly. Um, it's why we're having third parties come in and look at, hey, what are you guys doing? Uh, are you, are you, and ask them, hey, did we miss something here? And these are folks that are doing this work throughout the country and throughout other nations. They're not, um, well, they're, frankly, they're, they're the experts, all right? And so we're not doing this uh, in, a, in a vacuum uh, or without uh, any experience in the area. So the really um, the project is is being developed by experts. So uh, with that in mind, uh, we'll come to a decision of whether or not we want to move forward with it or not. Yeah, I've got one more uh, question, and then I think we're going to allow you to provide concluding remarks. I have a real quick question. Why has this not been advertised to the general residents? I heard nothing about it. If Tim hadn't sent me an email or a text about it, I wouldn't know, and neither would any of my neighbors that I know of. Well, let me, let me say I am just as frustrated about that as you are. And the reason is we haven't started public outreach. We really should have started public outreach a couple of years ago. We didn't get the funding for it. So um, we've got funding now and we're starting now. We're still at the beginning of the project. There's still time to shape the project. So um, that's why we're doing public outreach now. How much money does it cost to send an email to every Well, that's true, but there's a little bit more to it. We actually have to have the authority to move forward with the project. There's no sense in sending you an email if we're not doing the project. Questions. Thanks for uh, for coming tonight, um, and I appreciate the offer that you're going to come back again. Um, so, sort of like some of the other um, meetings that I've been to in the city, we try to bring both sides to the story. So, uh, if the association would be interested, we might ask for the Sierra Club, Friends of the River, League of Women Voters, maybe to give a counterpoint uh, discussion uh, or put their data online. And again, we're not trying to create drama. Um, we are trying to keep the city accountable and I appreciate all the effort you guys are putting in. How about a round of applause? Do we have one more? Uh... From the river said that they would be happy to attend and come talk. John Ovink. John Ovink. Oh, Mr. Ovink. Okay. John Ovink, who is one of the primary authors uh, who, again, spent many, many hours putting this together, acknowledging that they don't work for the water department. So uh, a lot of it's trying to interpret documents that the water department is kind enough to share uh, along with Phil Compton. I know he's here in the room uh, with Friends of the River and uh, a number of other folks. So if there are mistakes on here, it is what it is, right? We're, I understand. So if there are mistakes on this document, we'll do the best we can to get the most current information out. Definitely would love to have you back, sir. Um, to Susan's point about why are we not hearing about this? Um, it was brought up in Tampa City Council. That's sort of how I found out about it. You did get, I think it's $200,000 in funding for outreach. So just like any department, they're not funded to do outreach. They have to wait for money to accrue. And the uh, city council voted and they, they approved that uh, resolution. So now you have money 
Now you got to hire a contractor that puts together the outreach plan, et cetera, et cetera. It's it's challenging to uh, to do that. So you're welcome to stay. Uh, there is a bar over in the corner, as I mentioned earlier. I think some of us are going to be heading there next. Uh, it is open to the public, so there's a plug for uh, American Legion Post 111. I apologize. It is 77 degrees in here. There is a dance group next door, which we were not aware of. And I know most of you all want to go over there because they're having more fun line dancing. Um, they're there every Tuesday night. I didn't know that. For five bucks, you can learn how to line dance. Um, I'm going to point out a few things, and then we're going to have uh, our committee members come up. So if you all want to start to slowly kind of gravitate up here, uh, the reason we need to use microphones, again, is for the Zoom. So if you're in the back and you're talking, the people out in Zoom land are not going to be able to hear you. So again, this is a hybrid meeting. Um, Andrew Carranza right here uh, kicked me in the butt maybe three years ago, and he said, hey, I live next to Henry Nola Park. Uh, it's at Henry and Ola, if you don't know that. Henry and Ola Park is not in great shape. Uh, come on over here and let me show you a few things. My daughter uses this facility. Well, I don't have a daughter. My son's 26 and I hadn't been by Henry and Ola Park and he was absolutely right. I mean, the door to the bathroom, you couldn't even close it. The bathroom itself, you didn't want to go inside. Uh, so he's led a big effort to improve um, that particular park. If you were not aware of it, I mentioned earlier about surveys. Parks and Rec, uh, Sharissa Hills is the new director. She's still interim. Is she official now? So that's awesome. So Sharissa Hill is definitely a friend of Seminole Heights and Old Seminole Heights Neighborhood Association, uh, longtime member of the Parks and Rec Department. Um, they put together a master plan. So they held recently four master improvement uh, committee meetings we had reps at three of those. So even though we were only supposed to be in our area, we really wanted to beat the drum with their contractor. You might hear a theme here, right? These departments don't have the resources or the capacity necessarily to do all of this extra work that the mayor in this case uh, directed them to do. So we attended three and we advocated for Henry and Ola Park. If you haven't filled out the survey yet, I highly recommend you go to this website and I got to admit, AECON, who is the contractor for the master improvement plan, did a phenomenal job. And they used the Seminole Heights Garden Center as a model. So you literally go into a virtual Seminole Heights Garden Center. And the first person you run into is the mayor. And the mayor gives you a little speech. It's actually very cool. And then you walk around inside the garden center and you walk up to easels and you see what their plan is. And you can fill out a survey or you could have registered for those community meetings. So some other things that we've won, I don't know if one's the right word. Um, we have a new uh, volleyball court out there at McDougal Park. You'll see a slide here in a minute. Henry and Ola got their bleachers updated. Uh, they were uh, terrible. You get splinters as soon as you sat down. So they put in new boards for us. And there's a new uh, shade over the park at the Wayne C. Pappy Playground. Separately, this is uh, something that we just internally worked uh, as the Ocean Board. There's a, I should say Seminole Heights, sorry, Seminole Heights Garden Center. It's over by the river near the Ganey's property, if you know the Ganey's, and it's open to the public. You can join, you can garden and uh, enjoy the bounty over there. They came to us because we're a 501c3 and they wanted to apply for a grant. They just won the grant today. So they're getting $1,000 of free money from a national group. And uh, they're going to use that to uh, put in a new gardening shed and plantings around the shed, which is something they didn't even have. So we signed off on that. Uh, didn't really have to do a lot. Uh, they did the heavy lift, but they did win that. So can you go to the next slide? If you haven't been by uh, McDougal Park, go down Sly off of Nebraska, go east, and you're going to see four brand new sand court lots, um, volleyball. Uh, courts, which is fantastic. I mean, I I didn't even know they were doing that. And uh, it really is top notch. They really did a great job. We can go to the next slide. This is behind the Wayne C. Pappy Center. Nebraska is over here. So basically across the street. I don't have the laser pointer, but that is a playground that Oshna about five years ago gave a small amount of money to the group that runs the Pappy Center to put up this little playground for the kids uh, when they're not in the gymnastics class or they're waiting to get in for their classes. Go to the next slide. 
And you can see that shade structure was just recently installed. Again, not something that we asked for. The Parks and Rec just stepped up and did it. Um, stuff like that's very expensive. I mean, people don't think about it. It's like, well, if you had that in your backyard, it's maybe a thousand bucks. When you put it on public property and you've got to get it to government standard, it's a lot of money. Next slide. Um, Lynn Hertak, the vice president, uh, and uh, folks in the neighborhood involvement committee spent a lot of time at the end of last year, or was it two years ago? I can't even remember. Last year, COVID brain. So uh, the end of last year, and they showcased all 15 of the parks in our neighborhood. So uh, if you didn't get a chance to see that, they're still on our Facebook page. So it was a, sort of a 15 days of Christmas. It was the 15 days of parks in Seminole Heights. So I just wanted to point that out to you. And again, a lot of work. Each one of those um, presentations had a little write-up. So there's Henry and Ola, for example, some of the amenities, et cetera. Next slide. Okay, I'm gonna have the uh, membership uh, chair come on up, uh, Mo. And then if you see your name up there, if you want to, uh, we'll, we're gonna have one quick question before we start. Um, if you wanna start wandering up here, my thought was a lot of people that are in the membership don't know who the committee chairs are. They don't know who the board is. There may be a member. Um, so I thought that it would be helpful if folks would come up and just give a quick overview of what they've been working on. But before I do that, I'm gonna turn over to Lynn. I just wanted to remind you before you left um, that we are doing a raffle, um, not a raffle, just a giveaway. So if you are a member of OSHNA or wanna be a member of OSHNA, uh, go back and get your ticket. Um, so just reminding you to do that, we're gonna be doing that after all these presentations. All right, hello, I am Mo. Um, I'm your new membership committee chair. So, hello. <laughs> hello. I've been a member of, of, of the, the Neighborhood Involvement Committee for the last several years. So when, um, when Rich wanted to kind of take a break, because he's, he's been the membership chair for the last seven years, I offered to take it over from him. So be patient with me. R Rich is very, very, very organized. And he has all these great spreadsheets. I also organize, but if any transition, there's going to be some things that go on. So if you get a letter from me telling me that you haven't paid your membership, just let me know. Don't yell at me. <laughs> um, also, as a reminder, if you do want to become a member or you need to renew your membership, we do have the square back there, and we also have like the, the membership applications for you to go ahead and fill that out and join us as well. Uh, but I'm here to help. If there's anything you need, let me know. And I think that's it. My wine and I are going back to the back. Oh, you, thanks. Give me props. Yes. Hi, my name is Alyssa Getzoff. I am the... Um, chair of the Neighborhood Involvement Committee. And we coordinate a lot of events to try to get people involved with the old Seminole Heights Neighborhood Association, um, not only for community service, but also for just having fun. And um, we've also done a few things. We've created an app um, and if you've gotten one of our flyers on your door, um, we have a QR code that you could scan so you could download the app. We have a lot of social media. Um, and the next events are, um, we have a happy hour coming up at Southern Brewing and Wine Making on Nebraska Avenue um, from 6 to 8 p.m. on Thursday, August 19th. And uh, the next one will be on September 22nd at circa 1949. And hopefully we will have our holiday party in the next room over on Saturday, December 12th. But you'll hear more of these because Lynn is an excellent uh, <laughs> um, social media person and she gets this information out to everyone. And these are, well, we have the app, which is electronic, and the flyers, which if you did not get one, I encourage you to pick one up at the back table. And this was a brochure we put together. It's pro 2018 and 2019. So, and if you have any questions, just reach out to involved at Seminole Heights. 
right.org. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there anybody here tonight because they did get one of the one of these on their door? Okay, maybe they're in Zoom land. Um, guess what? We had uh, more than a thousand people move into our neighborhood in the last year. More than a thousand. So how do they know we have an association, right? So unless you're out walking your dog like Alyssa does and she jumps all over the new people. <laughs> yes, two people on Zoom uh, are attending because they, they got one of these. Well, they don't, oh, three people now. So they don't magically get put out there. So we spent a lot of time going out uh, after work or whenever and hanging these on doors, not in mailboxes. Um, so again, a lot of work to put this kind of stuff together. Okay, five people. Let's just keep this meeting going. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I also promise you when we're next door in December, it's going to be a lot cooler because um, the air conditioning works a lot better over there. So uh, Jack, why don't you come on up? And I kind of put you on the spot there with murals. So my name is Jack Simmons. I'm the chair of the Greenscape Space Committee. Um, we're looking at doing some murals throughout the community, but also, you know, any other ideas you might have for the green space. I'm fairly new to this committee, so we're looking to try to build it up. So if we have any volunteers that want to join the committee, I'll be here in the back after. You can see me or I guess email Oshna if you're on Zoom or anything like that. So if you have any questions or definitely want to get involved in the committee and have any ideas, you can see me after this. Hello, my name is Charles Schaub. I'm on the land use committee or responsible for the land use committee. Um, um, and as you know, Seminole Heights has its own special codes for building. And so we try to keep track of that, make sure people follow the codes. Uh, in fact, the one thing that Tim has listed there, there's a new apartment building proposed for the corner of Sly Avenue in, in Nebraska. It's uh, 285 units, it's, it's uh, 477 parking spaces. Um, and we've actually contacted the, the developer and asked them to, to make a presentation to either our board meeting or to a general um, meeting as well. So, uh, and he responded and said he, he would like to do that, but I think he said it's gonna get pushed out a little bit. So it's not an immediate issue right now, but we get a, a, um, a newsletter every month from the city that lists the, the projects that are going on. So, you know, people may be adding a accessory dwelling unit or they may be adding a garage or they're, they're actually building a new house or something like that. And they wanna know, they, they wanna do a design exception or they wanna do, uh, they have to rezone. And the, the, well, the apartment building is a rezoning issue. So, um, so there's lots of different steps that, that they have to follow. The city checks to make sure they're following the steps, but we kind of do another additional check because uh, we've actually supported some projects and we've actually opposed some projects uh, and some projects we didn't want to get involved with, but um, it's something that it's an ongoing thing every month, but not, I think we only get eight or 10 different notices about something going on, but um, but there's, there's, it's always every month. So um, if anybody has any questions or wants to join me on the land use committee, I'd be glad to entertain that. How are you doing? I'm Michael Gwynn. I'm the safety awareness chair. Um, our goal is really to educate, inform, and facilitate help as needed uh, with relation to safety, oftentimes neighborhood watch and police concerns, among other things. Um, lately, fortunately, we haven't been having a lot of problems in our area. You know, there's occasionally, um, people breaking into cars that are unlocked, you know, so TPD always encourages you to lock the cars and TPD often comes to our meetings. Um, you know, we invite them as part of this. And several people in the room are, uh, TPD coordinators with TPD. Um, so I appreciate y'all being here. Um, you have more than likely somebody in your Tampa police department grid that is a coordinator, um, However, there are a lot of grids that aren't covered. So if you're interested in being one or being on the committee with me, I uh, would definitely appreciate it because I'm only one deep. So there's only, only so much I can do by myself. Uh, one thing we did do is, as well as some other similar Heights neighborhood associations, we put together a uh, neighborhood crime watch sign 
TPD always encourages you to call you for anything that was suspicious, uh, whether something actually occurred or didn't, um, because they can start noticing bigger trends. It may not seem like a big deal at your particular incident, but if they get a lot of people with the same reports, then that means something else might be going on and they can follow that. Um, and oftentimes they say they don't know what the non-emergency number is. So um, it's helpful if it's in like almost every yard. I mean, the same principle as having like an alarm sign in front of your house. It, it just sometimes just having a sign helps prevent crime. Um, so yes, if you have any questions, definitely feel free to contact us. Uh, the safety awareness email is uh, be safe at oldseminarize.org. Also, these signs are for sale, uh, standalone or with a post on oldseminarize.org as well. Thank you. We're going to try Mauricio. Mauricio, ask him to talk. So um, Mauricio Rosas was a little under the weather. Uh, he's our Highways and Byways Chair, along with Doug Jessup. Uh, he's not on the right, and so. And uh, he's going to try to give his presentation from home, which is something we haven't done before. So <laughs> we'll see. Mauricio, if you can hear us, go ahead and uh, bring your presentation up. I am the co-chair with the Seminole Heights uh, Highways and Byways Committee, um, and uh, there's quite a bit on the table right now. Uh, there's We have the arterial BRT on Florida Avenue. Uh, that's an ongoing discussion, uh, and could use some help uh, with that. We're, I'm looking for at least three or four people who can be dedicated uh, around the entire area of the business. I have um, the, uh, Sorry, uh, 275 and the widening and the walls. Uh, I do have a small presentation that was submitted to me by FDOT. And uh, I, I, if, if we can't uh, last minute, if we can put that up on the uh, uh, OSHA Facebook website. Uh, then the other item too is the Hannah Avenue Municipal Building. Uh, the Hannah Avenue Municipal Building. It's a project that's been that started in 2015, uh, and thanks to Tim's work, he was able to uh, coordinate with the city to organize a walk with the neighborhood. Uh, and let me tell you, um, seeing it, seeing the, um, the the building itself, knowing that there's going to be 400 employees there, the entire dynamics of Hannah Avenue are going to change from 40th Street all the way to Florida Avenue. So this is not something that is just for the folks over on 30th or on 22nd Street. This is something that concerns all of us right to our connected Hannah Avenue. Um, and um, like I said, I can really, really use your, your help. Um, you can reach me easily. Uh, if you have a pen and pencil, you can write down my phone number, 813-727-6680. Uh, I'll repeat it again, 813-727-6680. Hey, Mauricio, this and, is, uh, uh, I'm going to address. I, I tell you what, I'm going to go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to cut you off. We're, we have a very weak I, signal here. So uh, we'll share the email on our side. But uh, let me just, okay. go yeah, thank you very much for your work. Um, for folks that don't know in the room or on the Zoom, uh, there's a there's a Heights Traffic Awareness Campaign Facebook page. So if you, and Mauricio runs that. So all of the materials he's referring to typically get posted there and then select items get reposted on the uh, Ocean of Facebook page. The city center concept that he referred to, um, Mona was there, Kathy Hare, who was in the room earlier, she was there. We had probably 50 people, residents, who showed up on a Saturday morning. We literally got on scooters, some of us, and rode scooters up and down Hannah Avenue out to 30th um, towards Hillsboro, back on Henry, and then uh, back north on 22nd Street. And um, it's a mess out there uh, as far as a lot of issues. So we, we definitely had a big win with the traffic department who showed up. And they were shocked at how bad the CSX 
rail line. If you go over that, you cannot go over it on a scooter. I mean, there's huge gaps. So we had to get off the scooters. Not that people are generally riding scooters, but thank you, Mauricio. He videotaped the entire thing. He's very good at that. And uh, we'll put that online and share it with the traffic department. Uh, is Brandy still here? Sorry. And Brandy was one of the leads. Sorry, I can't see everybody at once. Brandy was one of the leads. She's a resident here in, in our neighborhood, is also a member and works directly for that department. So, yeah, it's the mobility department. Mobility department. Sorry. I always think it's traffic department because there's a lot of traffic. Yeah. Just kidding. Mobility department, improving mobility. Um, so, thank you, Mauricio, for that presentation. The last thing I'm not trying to steal is Sunder I 275 sound walls that were promised multiple years ago. The last time I 275 was widened, uh, now they're going to. Uh, add another lane. So from downtown interchange up to north of um, Hillsboro, I think it's going to go almost all the way to Sly. Inside the current envelope, they're adding a general use lane. So thanks to Doug and many of you who went and fought because it was going to be a toll lane. It's no longer a toll lane, but it's still an addition. Uh, so more cars, more pollutants coming through. Um, but part of it is supposed to be a sound wall. If you look at the picture, guess what it looks like? It looks like a big slab of concrete. There's no design, there's no imprint, there's no things that remind you that you're living in Florida, palm trees, not that they're native, et cetera. Um, so I have gone back into them and I said, hey, how about you ask the residents what you would like on the sound walls? They're also gonna improve under the bypass or under the, uh, the routes under 275, so Hannah, Sly, um, some of the other ones, Osborne. Uh, they're going to improve the lighting. I know we have a lot of problems with homeless. Uh, they're going to do a lot of uh, upgrades. Again, they didn't ask us what we want, so we've asked them to give us a chance to speak to that. So things that are historic in nature would look good in our area. The last one is home tour. I am the chair for that. It's just sort of traditionally been the president. The next home tour is April 3rd, 2022. Pending COVID, um, we've had to cancel it the last two years. It is our biggest fundraiser. It takes about 150 volunteers to pull that off. So everybody in this room is a volunteer automatically. So come see me after the meeting. Um, we are gonna be looking for houses. We've got some longtime home tour volunteers like Nancy, Susan, Cinda, et cetera. Many, many people in this room, Michael, uh, who have done uh, either on the committee or people have been docents, Larry and Kevin, by the way, can we thank Kevin Box for those killer cookies? And I don't think he wants to take them home because he's now an official triathlete, so he's not allowed to eat cookies anymore. Uh, congratulations, Kevin, on seriously, that's absolutely amazing that you're a triathlete and has competed. There are extra cookies here, so please take them. Yeah, you forgot candy. Oh, sorry. I'm going to have Lynn come up. That was definitely a mistake. There's even a spot for you there. I was going to type it in. Um, uh, hi, all. Um, I'm Lynn Hertak, and I'm in charge of communication. So I do all the social media and the bungalow alerts. And uh, I don't think Alyssa Fiejo is here tonight, but she does the um, advisor. And I know a couple of people were interested in possibly writing for the advisor. So if you are interested in that, you can email info at oldseminoleheights.org and we can get you connected with that. Um, but, you know, I can always use some social media help as well. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, info at oldseminoleheights.org. Okay, next slide. I think that wraps it up. Um, not going to go through this. If you haven't uh, taken a chance to download the app, it's going to get some upgrades. Um, um, Amanda has been diligently working through thousands of pictures. Uh, a lot of those came from Doug, who I think was here taking pictures, but I think he's already departed. Um, so over the years, we've collected, uh, I don't want to say tens of thousands. How many have you gone through? Does it seem like tens of thousands? 2,000, so 2,000 pictures of, of happy people's faces at porch parties and home tours in the past. So those are gonna be on the app. Uh, we'll do this at the next meeting. Some of them will be. And yeah, next slide. 
So again, join a committee, get involved. Uh, porch parties, obviously with COVID, we've been uh, pushing those off. We are gonna be doing the two outdoor uh, happy hours, uh, as Alyssa already mentioned. The I mentioned the half, sorry, Heights Traffic Awareness members. Uh, you can certainly join that and help out Mauricio. Uh, questions, either info at or involved at. If you wanna send it to me, you can send it to president at, um, and I'll be happy to respond to you. I am always surprised at the comments and the questions that we get through our new website, uh, which Lynn had a huge hand in um, rolling out. So a lot of the folks that are attending on Zoom sent messages and I replied back to them and said, yeah, we'd love to have you involved. Next slide. So how about any questions from the audience before you get your second cookie? Get a little sure high. Susan. 24th of October is the Fifth annual. Wait. Cinda Hitchcock is sort of the lead for that. Okay, and I'm going to repeat that because again, for the folks in Zoom, fifth annual uh, Seminole Heights Garden Tour. You can see the shirts that the two ladies are wearing in the back. Um, here's another one right here. Um, that money largely goes back to support the Summerfest, which is something OSHNA supported and continues to support at the library. It's a program during the summer open to all the kids in the local area, uh, fire department, the bookstores open, et cetera. It's usually a fantastic event, but just like anything, it costs money to put together. So um, how many gardens do you guys have at this point? And do you already have those gardens? Okay, so right now seven gardens have already been filled and we're looking for one more plus two bonuses that were in the past. And if you haven't done the garden tour, it's a fantastic, it's outdoors, so certainly safe in today's environment. Any other questions or announcements? Go ahead. Oh, the raffle. That's really why you all are still here, right? Is the raffle. I thought it was me. So Len, why don't we, uh, do you want to just pull them up yeah. there? I think we're done with the Zoom, so we could probably uh, 